Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Friday, October 18th. Derek and Riper Eno Saris here with you on this episode. We had an all-timer in Game 3 of the ALCS on Thursday night. We'll talk about a few takeaways from that, including the possibility that, among all things, kind of drifting toward average-ish level performance if hitters wane in the postseason because everything's more difficult. Perhaps elite relievers wane a little bit in the postseason because they're facing a better group of hitters than they're used to facing. So we'll pull on that thread a little bit. Got some questions about early NFBC drafts. It's already happening. We'll take a look at some of the top end pitchers, where they're going, where we might disagree as we've got some drafts coming up in the near future. First pitch Arizona, two weeks away. If you have not made plans to get there, you still got time to do it. Go to baseballhq.com for all of the details. You know, how's it going for you on this Friday? It's good. I'm uh I've got a a, a day planned. Uh, a friend of mine was in a car accident, so I've got to drop off some flowers for his daughter. Not not her too bad, just the seat belt. Uh, mm. but it was a hit and run, so mm. and um then I think I'm uh gonna try and watch as much of these games as I can while also going to a show tonight. And I have choices for the shows, and I haven't decided between punk and a track it's like kind of kind of trip hop so going out i haven't gone out in a little bit and uh it's gonna be fun it's gonna be a fun night the beauty of the west coast game times is that you could actually have life after sports i do miss that uh, if you'd like to have life online with sports our discord is available using the link in the show description we got some threads set up for both games that'll be happening on friday not much for us to preview on those games because again timing leaves it such that we really can't tell you anything about that game that you won't already have seen by the time you listen to the show. But as I mentioned up top, game three of the ALCS was an all-timer because Emmanuel Class A doesn't really give up homers. And I thought the big homer he gave up already happened when Kerry Carpenter got him in the last round. Two in one inning seems impossible because there have been full seasons where Class A has given up two all year. And it was Aaron Judge and John Carlos Stanton getting Class A at the eighth inning, which left the door open for all sorts of things to happen in the time that followed. There's a ton to unpack with this game. And one that, one that will be lost completely in history, one performance, is Matthew Boyd, right? If the Guardians find a way to come back in this series and move on to the World Series... Of the things people remember about Game 3, it's going to be the epic homers at the end. It's going to be the game-tying home run in the ninth from John Kenzie Noel. It's going to be the walk-off homer from David Fry in the 10th. But the performance of Matthew Boyd, five innings of one-run ball, was so desperately needed for a Guardians bullpen that's been worked very heavily already in this series and with this cluster of three games all together before the next off day. We know Gavin Williams is going in game four on Friday. We talked about the possibility of him giving them four plus innings and that being really important. I think Boyd's performance has a carryover benefit of taking a little bit of pressure off of Gavin Williams. If the Guardians don't like what they see from Williams in game four, they can at least feel better about going to the bullpen earlier than they were planning. If Boyd had been knocked around, only gone through the lineup once, that would have put them in a much more precarious position. Um, so I think that's just one of those performances that deserves a little bit of acknowledgement because all the excitement that happened later sort of washed that out of our memories. Yeah, there is the law of exposure, though, which is that, you know, uh, the Yankees have now seen all these Guardians relievers multiple times. Um, you know, even with Boyd going five, Kate Smith still threw a, a whole inning, Tim Heron threw a whole inning. Uh, Hunter Gaddis, two thirds. Um, you know, Morgan got in the game. Drew Walters got in the game. You know, everybody got in the game. You know, nobody's like fully rested. I don't know. I can't. Who's who didn't pitch yesterday that they want to pitch in a close game tomorrow? Pretty much nobody. I mean, they, that's right. part of using eight pitchers, right? At least they didn't go four or five outs. I guess is what you're right. saying. So no, yeah, none of the relievers topped eighteen pitches. That Kate was Smith Peter threw ten. Right. Yeah, Hunter Gaddis through 10. So they're relatively fresh for this time of year, I guess. So 
Uh, but at the same time, these guys have seen them. Uh, you know, Judge, there was some talk online about the idea that um, could, uh, you know, Eli Ben Parat was talking about like, could weird pitches um, have like, have less effect in the traject era where you can say, hey, I'm gonna go downstairs and just practice on Emmanuel Classe's cutter, you know, and just have 30 of them. And I get some of that, but I'm also not fully clear myself on what kind of access you get to the traject in an away stadium. Because I believe the traject is in the home hitters area, and I do believe that usually those are separate. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, think you would you share have. that. I think you'd make sure the opposing team can't go in there and dial up your pitchers and focus on hitting pitches that look like the ones your pitchers throw in your park. So maybe he was doing that in New York, but I don't doubt he was doing that in that game before he saw him. One thing that I think is, you know, I, I tend to be kind of an Occam's razor guy. And I think the Occam's razor, the most simplest explanation here is that the cutter that Classe throws is actually more effective against lefties. We know cutters have platoon splits, and we know that even over the course of Emmanuel Classe's, you know, brilliant career, the slugging percentage against righties is 100 points. It's like 120 points higher against righties than lefties. Now, it's tiny against lefties, and so it's not great against righties. It's still like 340. <laughs> mm. um, but then you throw in the fact that it's Aaron Judge, and Aaron Judge and the Yankees saw some of the best stuff plus over the course of the season. You know, I, I only have this update from, um, you know, the from the from halfway through the season. But I think it serves as a, a sort of a viewpoint into divisional strength. And what you have is uh, Cleveland saw 98 stuff plus over the course of the season. Uh, Kansas City saw 96, nine. Uh, New York saw 101, four, you know, Tampa Bay, you know, where they might have some uh, some park effects for Stuff Plus. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the context of the Mets series. But they saw the most. Angels saw the Astros a lot. They got a 104. The AL East is way high in this. So in any case, I would say you're Aaron Judge. You see the other team's best relievers all year. Right? Yeah. I mean, the matchups, like you're your opponent will use the best possible relievers against judge as often as they can. Like the bar is just set higher because you're, you're the hitter. Every other team's worried about you and Soto are the guys that are the priority matchups for the bullpen. So yeah, you're naturally going to see better stuff if you're better players on those teams. Yeah. On the flip side, John Kensky, Noel and David Fry. Um, you know, I think these are two hitters that maybe in the past may not have been on the Guardians. I think there's a little bit of an aspect of changing their idea about lineup building to some extent. John Kensky Noel is not from Neil Reyes, but he's not not from Neil Reyes. <laughs> and so, you know, in the past, I think the Guardians tried that for a while and they were like, eh, it doesn't fit our philosophy. Even this year, they had Ramon Laureano, who's kind of a grip it, rip it, hit it hard and miss it kind of guy. And they said, no, thanks. And he went on and played for another team and played pretty well down the stretch. With Noel, to some extent, they've said, nah, that's our guy. That's our grip it and rip it and miss it guy. And we're cool with it with one guy. And he was exactly what they needed at that moment. Because exactly what they needed, yes. When you got two outs and a guy on, you're down by two, it's not a good time to get a single. It's really not a good time to get a single. You know, that's what the Guardians have been good at. But a single just means, God, the next guy might get it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, and that's why I was a little surprised to see Daniel Schneeman getting the start in this game, right? Like, you put Schneeman out in right field. He's 0 for 4. Schneeman's the guy that Noel pinch hit for at the end of the game. The matchup was against Clark Schmidt, a righty. So, I, I mean, I guess that's like, okay, Schneeman's a lefty, so you're playing matchups there. But Schneeman, give, it's kind of like the Will Brennan thing where there might be a, a useful big league skill set there, but who's going to help you more against top-level pitching? Even if Noel's and who's more likely to hit a homer? Like in this game, a yeah. homer changes so much. And I, I, you take an 0 for 4 with a chance at a homer, you know, in this case, especially when you have all these other guys getting on base. Like, I, I think Noel is the best fit. I would actually be playing him. Um, and I... 
and Fry as a pinch hitter, like I get it and it really worked out, but I, I might start Fry too. So, well, and the other part of it too is they, they decided to flip the catchers. They started Austin Hedges. Bo Nigler came up on a spot later. Both catchers actually got hits, which was a huge turn for the Guardians. And I, I mean, they, they, they were due, uh, as my grandpa Pat used to say. <laughs> He's due actually worked the first time I ever heard it. I think it was Chris Singleton who was due in the 90s. And he popped a home run. I looked at my grandpa. And I was like, that was magic. How often can you do that? He never did it again. So <laughs> right. good usage his, of the his trick. His due doesn't act as a gambler's fallacy. It doesn't work. <laughs> it, it works really with, when an eight-year-old sees someone pull it off. It sure looks like it works, especially when he doesn't do it all the time. But you look at the way the lineup's built. It's like, okay, you're going to go with hedges. You're going glove even more extreme glove, less bat with hedges. Do you really want to play the higher OBP game with the hitters in front of him? Or would you rather just have Noel out there in case some combination of Manzardo, Ramirez, Naylor, or Thomas is on base? Like I'd base rather have the big swing. Double or a homer, yeah. In that spot, if you're going to play the less inspiring of your two hitters behind the plate and then have the toggle off the bench. I think Steven Vogt played that part right. Even though... I expressed I guess, some of my my interest in Bo Naylor long term and believing there's still more for him as a hitter. I think using Naylor after hedges makes sense given how the Guardians did be kind of selective about when they go to their bench because and having allowed them hedges up use, late is a problem. It also allowed them to use Brennan as a pinch hitter for a catcher and then go to the other catcher. So mm -hmm. that that makes some sense to me. And I guess keeping Noel as a break glass when when needed like he could have come in for Josh Naylor. I mean, I don't know. He could have come in for Kyle Manzardo. Like you, you actually allow yourself more flexibility with Noel and Fry on the bench for when they come in. You can wait till someone's on base. You can wait till the right moment. You know that defensively, Fry. I guess if the elbow is hurting, you don't even really want him out in the field at all, right? And you know, right. with Noel, defensively, he's limited. What he has the big arm. You know, these are these are actually probably ideal pinch hit guys because they can come in and maybe pop a homer for you. And that's exactly what they did on the at bat. Noel versus Weaver. I think one thing that we saw is Weaver's only thrown two cutters this entire postseason, one against the Royals and one against the Guardians. I think he needs to dust that off because Noel 50 50 would him and said, I think this is going to be a change up in the zone uh, when it was when he was in the one oh count. He says, if I'm wrong. I, I'm way late on the fastball, and it's a 1-1 count, and I'm still in this. If I'm right, I'm going to hit this dinger. Uh, and he hit that dinger. So um, I think Weaver needs to to throw the cutter, even though it's not his best pitch. I think even guys who throw two dominant pitches can use a third non-dominant pitch sometimes. This is something we talked about with Landon Knack. And I think this is going to be part of – the sort of quote unquote trends that we see in the postseason that become more important next year for everybody. I think everybody is going to debut a new pitch next year. <laughs> I remember seeing it, I think it was maybe two off seasons ago. Was it Ryan Presley started throwing a change up in the playoffs and he hadn't thrown them all year, but it was actually a really good pitch. And it's like, whoa, now you got a, a third thing you reliably are throwing. That's hitters not have to completely, completely have to rewrite their book on the fly. It's hard to do. So maybe you can't do it as much as Presley did. But I think if we are in the era of you're going to go out there and get three, four, five, six outs instead of just getting you know, two or three, that's going to push relievers, especially guys like Weaver, who've been used a lot. Like he's clearly mm -hmm. the guy they want on the mound when all the all the chips are out there right now. You need to have that extra wrinkle. So I, I think you're right. I think he absolutely starts to show that cutter a little bit more, especially in this series, but probably in the World Series as well if the Yankees end up advancing. It's interesting how much a series can flip in 24 hours. Both series, like the vibes are on both. I mean, I think Thursday morning, we were looking at this one wondering, okay, can the Guardians claw back in? Are the Mets going to counterpunch and level the NLCS at two? And the Mets had some chances. They had a couple of, of situations against Phillips. Uh, and trying in where they had traffic, it, they were down big, but one swing could have brought them back into it. There was that Nimmo fly ball with was it Nimmo with fly ball with the bases loaded, and it was like it, seven to two, and it would have mm -hmm. brought them to seven to six, and it was yeah, it was ten feet short, but 
but yeah, it was it's just the there was there were a couple of little windows where maybe they could have got back into it. I think the main critique I've seen of the Mets was that you know, Jose Quintana probably stayed in this game too long, especially with his form. I saw that critique in our Discord. I saw some people tweeting about it. And I think uh, Michael Bauman of Fangraphs had a, a pretty good nugget in his recap that Quintana in his previous three starts had allowed 13 base runners over 16 and a third innings with 14 strikeouts. Those are numbers that you never would have expected from Quintana, especially with the, the, so much on the line at this point in the season. And he was doing that while throwing just 57.5% of his pitches for strikes, 37.5% of those in the zone. So living outside the zone was working for a while, but we know the Dodgers, with the quality of the lineup they have, they're a very patient team. That approach wasn't working. So I think even though they've been able to get away with leaving Quintana, especially in games longer than we've expected, this was a spot where going to the bullpen earlier than expected was probably the right call. Again, hindsight's twenty twenty, but I think that's probably the most valid criticism I see of how the Mets played it in game four. And I don't think this game was as lopsided as, as the as the box score suggests. I mean, uh, the Mets had more hard hit balls. They had 10 hits to the Dodgers 12. Uh, it's it's really it's one of those things with sequencing where like, you know, give um you know, somebody give that Vientos homer with the bases loaded or, you know what I mean? Like instead of the bases empty, like, you know, put this double here instead of there. Um, and things could have been a little bit different. Um, I do think that the thing that does upset me is actually really a little bit to that Quintana nugget that you're saying is that if I'm a Mets fan, the thing that upsets me is that these Dodgers are not chasing in terms of chase rate in the playoffs, it's the Yankees with a 22% chase rate, uh, swing at pitches outside the zone, and then the Dodgers at 26. Those are the best. The Mets at 32%, that's pretty much average. Average for the playoffs, That's it's not a problem. But the Dodgers and Yankees are in an extreme patient stance right now, and that's to their benefit. I think... Last night, Max Muncy saw like 16 pitches outside of the zone, swung at two. Two. That's the Dodger way right now. And if you, I think you have to see that in real time a little bit and be like, oh, Quintana lives kind of outside of the zone ish, and they're really locked in right now. I got to bring somebody else in. And I don't know who it is because Peterson is kind of similar. <laughs> well, and yeah. McGill and McGill hasn't been pitching that well. And you used McGill in the game prior, Before, right? So right. you didn't really have that because he was chewing up innings. You kind of wanted you to rest Peterson to more for game Budo five. For like three innings. He's yeah. a former starter. I mean, I think as a, as a staff, and especially in the bullpen, we talked about it going into the playoffs. One of the Mets' relative weaknesses was a high walk rate. As a team, even though their pitching has performed well, they've done it despite free passes. If that's your weakness, the Dodgers are built to exploit that. So that's yeah. where I think the the edge has really kind of flipped a lot is just being able to work the Mets pitchers, get them into situations where they're using guys they didn't necessarily Mets want had to the use. Third highest walk rate as a staff this year behind the White Sox and Angels. That's not necessarily a place you want to be. And I think it actually is a little bit indicative of stuff because if you uh, go over to Stuff Plus as well, uh, you know, as a staff, the Mets uh, had mediocre sort of averages Stuff Plus. And especially if I switch it over to starting pitching, I believe uh, they had uh, poor. They're 18th in starting pitching stuff plus. So what do you do if you're 18th in starting pitching stuff plus and, you, and you're and you kind of cobbling together a pitching staff? You throw 80 million different types of fastballs <laughs> and you throw a lot of pitches outside the zone. You kind of dance around in the shadow. And uh, a team that's going to really lock in and sit there is going to put pressure on that. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what Dodgers have been able to do so far. We saw Otani uh, get on the board, the leadoff homer with nobody on base. His struggles with the bases empty had been documented. I think that's the kind of like the Mookie Betts wasn't hitting in the playoffs thing. Where you're like, well, that's Just not going to last. Just a sample thing that our brains yeah. are making narratives out of, yeah. Right, you're just like, well, that's weird, and you write about it or talk about it, and then you expect it to change, and it and changed. Mookie it's Betts gone. homered again. <laughs> Four-hit game for Mookie Betts. And, you know, this, this looked like a kind of 
classic Dodger sort of performance, though, where everybody who came through was supposed to come through. They were lo- they're loaded with high end players, right? You, you got something from Otani, you got something from Betts, you got sixteen swinging strikes from Yoshinobu Yamamoto, and even though he still, I think he threw seventy three pitches. 8Ks, one walk, two earned runs, four and a third. He wasn't lights out, but he was good. Like He he did enough to let them turn it over to probably their two favorite relievers or two of their three favorite relievers with Phillips and Trinan before it got out of hand and they could just coast with Enriquez for two innings. So I, I think the, the follow-up question I have for you from what we saw with Walker Bueller on Wednesday was did stuff across the board play up for Yamamoto and the other pitchers that we saw in game four of the NLCS. It did, absolutely. Yamamoto had three inches more ride uh, on his four-seamer, three inches uh, more horizontal movement on the slider, which is pretty important um, given that uh, he, uh, he also had more drop on the slider. This is pretty important given that you know, to some extent, the Mets were happy with putting righties in against Yamamoto because he has some reverse splits. And it's possible that he has legit reverse splits because Yamamoto, you know, is the weirdest thing about him is he doesn't have a great slider. He's got a great splitter and curveball. So it is possible that a pitcher like that would have reverse platoon splits given his pitch mix. He comes out there, he throws a slider more and he's thrown it all year and it has better movement than it had all year. So you know, that's another thing where you're like, oh, wow, why why all these pitches have better movement? But it's not like one team or the other. Phillips training, their stuff was up. Training doesn't need his stuff to be up, but it was. Three inches more drop on the sinker for training and three inches more sideways movement on his sweeper and his sinker. I mean, even more turbo, you know? But uh, on the other side, you know, Quintana's uh, movement was all up horizontally. Jose Budo's movement uh, was up. He had more ride on the four seam and uh, more sweep on the sweeper. So, you know, when I when I look and see all these movements up, you know, there's a lot of things going on because, you know, Yamamoto, uh, his spin was up, but a little bit less than Walker Bueller's. You know, 64 RPM on the four seam, 94 on the slider, 115 on the cutter. These, as I said, are within one standard deviation. And just for the less mathematically inclined, one standard deviation can be both significant and not important. And the reason I say that is one standard deviation means you're out. So within one standard deviation is 68% of the normal variance. So two thirds of the normal stuff you see all year is in within one standard deviation. So once you get past one standard deviation, you're still within the normal range, quote unquote, but you're in the 32%. You're in the one third, you're, you're in the like head scratching, like what's going on over here kind of stuff, right? So it's not quite where it's like two or three standard deviations where that's where we saw spider tack and pine tar, you know, that's where you're like, uh, circle this, this is super weird, you know? So it's more in the, uh, huh. And it's also in the kind of approved gray area, which is sweat and rosin and, and bullfrog that's around a hundred RPM. I wouldn't mention this again, because again, the numbers are a little bit smaller for Yamamoto and the spin numbers are not up for everybody. The spin numbers are up for a lot of people, but not everybody. But we did a little bit of sleuthing <laughs> and none of the umpires that have ever busted somebody for s- sticky stuff, none of those umpires, as far as we can tell, are on the CS umpiring cruise. <laughs> right. Yeah. You'll notice uh, no Phil Cuzzy, for example, right? Phil Cuzzy was like the guy who at, at one point had busted everybody. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, there's Bill Walsh. There's a there's a couple other guys now that have busted people, and none of those guys are on these ones. So I'm not saying that baseball is uh, did this on purpose. I bet you baseball is just wants the best strikes callers because they don't want people belly aching about strike calls all the way through the playoffs. They, that's they, I think that's their number one thing. I think what might just be is coincidence that those guys aren't on there. But I I wanted to mention it because of course if one guy goes out there and he's got sweat or bullfrog and he gets away with it and he they're touching him that'll spread like wildfire he can just go back to the to the the dugout or to the to the bullpen when he's done and say yeah man like th- this guy doesn't care about that stuff so 
and, and so that's one thing we can't know if that's true or not we'll never know and i think it's not actually worth worrying too much about although people love it it's kind of salacious the other part is atmospheric conditions and so we've talked about salt in the air salt in the air can change the way move the balls move um but there are other things they can do it john smoltz brought up um the way the wind was uh it was favoring hitters they did the, they did the graphic where they show and that's from uh our friends at uh what was that place called again um the weather people anyway the the wind applied metrics so the people at wind applied metrics gave us this great graphic at the beginning of the game where it was the wind was blowing out like and it was aiding balls seven to ten feet in every direction and Don Smoltz said, well, that also actually aids the pitchers to some extent because it's better to throw into the wind. Now, I don't know if that's true. I haven't had the chance to check that with Alan Nathan, baseball's resident physicist. But I do believe that wind can be a factor uh, and salt content can be a factor and temperature can be a factor into the way that balls are moving. And we're seeing, since we're seeing like a sort of across the board increase in movement, I would assume it's more atmospheric because I don't think every pitcher, even if they were told the, the the umpire isn't busting people, that every pitcher would immediately go to it. Right. It doesn't seem nefarious, um, at yeah, least as like a like primary cause. City Field is augmenting pitcher stuff right now. And uh, I think that probably helps the team. Curiously, I think this is true. I think it helps the team with more stuff and more command better because they're throwing higher stuff pitches more in the zone, right? Mm -hmm. And the Mets have been throwing pitches outside the zone a lot. So somebody has to trust their quote-unquote better stuff in the zone more tonight, if it's David Peterson or whoever follows him. You know, we were talking about the Mets' success against relievers after reading that Robert Orr piece over at Baseball Prospectus earlier in the week, too. And it's another, it's another possible explanation for why the Mets are good against relievers. Right. If you see better stuff because of the atmospheric conditions at your park, it, it's like you're you're turning up the difficulty all the time and you're less surprised by it when when you see it in general. Like maybe that's a little part of the Mets were how, facing how are they the doing that? best stuff plus at, at the halfway mark. So, yeah. And if, if your park is elevating everyone's stuff, right, that's part of how you got there. Part of how you got to that fourth toughest stuff plus that you saw in the aggregate. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Lots, uh, lots to unpack there, but yeah, weather and atmospheric conditions probably a pretty big factor in why we're seeing some of the things we're seeing at City Field right now. Adam, Adam Adovino talked about that on our pod back when he joined us. Geez, that was probably back in May or June now. But he mentioned the differences. I think it was he was talking about day and night games being very different at City Field too because of the wind patterns changing. Yeah, and I think it also is kind of goes feeds into my larger narrative for people thinking about this through, through about the fantasy lens it's like you know i think that a lot of what we're watching right now is going to make you a worse fantasy analyst or like you know it's you're tempted right now to say oh walker bueller is back let me put him on his let me put him on my sleeper list you know? I just want to put Walker Bueller on the Mets and get half of the starts in that ballpark <laughs> with those conditions. Like that's that's I mean, all I want. Totally a, a possibility, but the other possibility is he had a one game augmentation of stuff due to the the atmospheric conditions and that's not something that you want to bet on for a full season, you know. <laughs> so, I think that the NCAA tournament effect is something you just want to keep in mind. Like don't draft somebody based on what they did in the postseason entirely. Well, that's uh, extremely relevant to something I wanted to bring up on today's show <laughs> anyway, because I started to wonder if Yamamoto is actually a little underrated. We have a few October drafts in the books. It's draft and hold, so that means 50 rounds, slow clocks. So only two have been completed so far, but I'm getting those emails from the NFBC that drafts are close to filling, trying to entice me, trying to pull me into that first one for God, 2025. Seems like such folly. Our information about injury is so low. I mean, you could it's be not drafting folly, somebody sir. who might get injured in these playoffs. Yeah, I guess that that's still a concern. But I am adamant that the edge you have is now more so than later. You have an edge later, but the edge is greater right now mm -hmm. if you've got your homework already done. But Yamamoto, I believe, is the 14th starting pitcher 
off the board. No, the 12th starting pitcher off the board because there's only one closer ahead of him. That's Emmanuel Class A. Going around pick 50 in these first two drafts. Pick 37, pick 63. So not a lot of agreement in those two drafts. As things progress, we get more information. Maybe he'll bump up a couple of spots. Maybe another good outing or two in the World Series if the Dodgers go through. Also boosts up his stock a little bit because in his case, you're getting proof that he's healthy. I think that's as much why you're getting a little discount in these early drafts on Yamamoto as anything else. Now that we've seen him in the States for you know 102 and a third innings combining the postseason uh, with the regular season, what do you make of him and his arsenal? You mentioned it's a little strange he doesn't have a slider. Do you think there's any reason to believe he might be able to develop one at this stage? Or do you look at him and say, he's 26, he's got a lot of stuff that works, he's gone this far without a slider, Maybe there's a reason why he doesn't have a feel for that pitch. He's going to add something else instead. Regardless, like the results were good. 28.5% K rate this year, 6% walk rate, 12% swinging strike rate, over 30% for CSW. This does look like an ace on a per inning basis. The only other thing I would bring to the table again is something that was brought up by our listeners. Yamamoto never started on four days rest. That's a Dodger thing too. Even Tyler Glasnow made one start all year another thing. on four days rest. The other thing is, if there's evidence that only A health grades matter mm. and everybody else is kind of in a bucket, then I only want A health grades for my first pick. Ah, Especially okay. if I'm going in the first two rounds. Do you now, already have health grades for 2025? I don't, but I don't. There's no way you're giving Yamamoto an A. Yeah, he he wouldn't get an A. Uh, well, let, let, let's and look so, at the guys that are going ahead of him and see who would get an A. Uh, but go ahead. Sale wouldn't get an A. Degrom wouldn't get an A. No chance. Um, I don't think Cease would get an A. I don't think Scooble would get an A either. I don't think Reagans would get an A. I don't think Snail gets an A. So, no, if Snell you're couldn't. talking first two rounds for me, I think the only options are Skeens. I don't think Wheeler got an A, but maybe he should get an A. I mean, it's A-ish. Um, Skeens, Wheeler, Gilbert, and Kirby. Yeah, that's a pretty short list of pitchers to choose from. So then... It really is. Simple philosophical question, if you have the do chance to go take get them... Skeens? Yeah, do you so want to you... go get them where they're going? Or do you say, you know... I peace out on all of you guys. I'm just I'm just building pitching staffs differently this year. Injury is such a big mountain for us all to deal with that I'm tempted to say, hey, I'm just going to go hitters for four and then go pitchers for six. Like, okay. you know, maybe throw a, a hitter in there somewhere in the six, but... If I do that, what I'm doing is I'm getting four really good hitters. I'm getting the meat of my lineup, right? Might be able to kind of get most of the infield and, and an outfielder, you know. I could get four or five good hitters. And then I'm attacking kind of the Yamamoto area, hopefully. You know, I'm getting Yamamoto and Snell. Okay, Hopefully. so you might double tap. So you're that that'd be at the end of round three, beginning of round four, potentially. You're saying more like planning on hitters. If these pitchers are here at this point, then I'm in on pitching. If they're not there, I move down to the next group, which you see but a few more closes tap in each of these groups. I don't know. I just the only if the if the list is so small. There is obviously two paths in the forest. The list is so small, you have to get one of the small list. I think Kirby in the third makes a lot of sense for me. And I know there's people out there that weren't excited about what Kirby did this year, but he pitched a lot of innings and they were good. What if I told you that because the early pick of the two is 26, that we would probably forecast more of a late second round ADP on Kirby? Then that, I then I it would depends a little circle. bit on positioning. You would just probably take him with the second rounder, knowing that those they'll be hitters. Or just still circle Kirby and, Kirby and Gilbert. And if I can, if both are on the board and I'm near the turn, then maybe I can leave them on the board. If they're if I'm not near the turn, then I just take Kirby. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
The other pitcher in that group that would have an A health grade, most likely, we don't know where he's pitching in 2025, is Corbin Burns. He goes right there between Kirby and Gilbert. We saw the K rate drop. Then we saw him bring the sweeper back at the end of the year. Which and, I, and there was a drop in velo that just had me a little bit concerned. But see, the thing is, when you start talking about health, it's like the, everything can concern you. A rise in velo, a drop in velo. <laughs> Don't do He's anything. Been... Stay exactly the same. Don't change anything. <laughs> yeah. Just stand still. You start throwing a sweeper? Oh, no, that's not good. <laughs> Keith Meister said that's bad. Yeah, yeah. You, could, you can find anyone that will tell you that everything a pitcher does is bad. There's a I source that will tell you anything a pitcher does in the bad. first is is kind of brilliant in this environment. Okay, so you're you're leaving your mind open to mid first round pick schemes and then piecing I out and pitching for a while. I don't like taking Scubel in the first. I don't like taking Sk- Sale or Degrom in the second. Like I, it's there's a little bit easier for me to be like I don't like taking these guys in these places. So Scubel, I assume, is the injury concern from pre twenty four, right? I mean, pretty the, big workload. They just jumped his workload, you know, after having an injury concern. Yeah, that's going to be a final count of two hundred and eleven innings for Scubel between the regular after season and the playoffs. A previous high of like one forty or something. You got to one forty nine a third in twenty twenty one. It's a big jump for me. Okay. Yeah, it's going to cost you a late first round pick, maybe even a mid first round pick if you end up wanting Scooble in 2025. Wheeler, Wheeler, uh, Wheeler, you know, Skeens and Wheeler, those are interesting to me. If I could get Wheeler in the second around the turn, you know, I got a bat, I got Wheeler, I'd feel pretty good. Yeah, I feel like Wheeler's kind of crept up into the place where Garrett Cole lived for a long time, kind of the older guy that has really good skills. Pretty good long-term health. I know Cole was just hurt this year, so that's why Cole's coming at a discount. But right. I think there's that that really high floor that I think people are starting to feel with with Wheeler that's driving him into that range. I loved Sale this year, where he was going. Seeing him as the fifth pitcher off the board, that definitely makes me nervous. I mean, the good news has been that I think he's been able to start throwing already after you know, missing time at the end of the season. You're throwing in October. Things are generally okay, but there might be. I wonder how many people are going to go into the uh, draft next year thinking he was never hurt last year. It's possible to think that. Like if if you kind of tapped out because your your teams were sort of done the last couple of weeks and you weren't really following for any sort of postseason and reasons. Also, the way that the that. Braves reported things did not make it seem like he was hurt. But he never pitched again after his last start, like September 14th or something. Yeah, he ended up getting to 177 and two thirds innings. That was the most that Sale had thrown in a season since 2017. But they were really good. Got the K rate over 30 percent again. I think your I um, your I don't hat taking... situation changed, by the way, on Sale. I think it expired. Enough time has passed. We don't have to eat the hat. Eat the hat for what? For how many? Sale innings? being an ace again. Oh yeah. Did I say he would never be? I think you did. But it, it was a long time ago, so maybe maybe you're okay. The um, I don't I don't mind taking a guy like Sale, who, you know, maybe Snellish is kind of Salish. Like you, last year's Sale. I, I think the difference for me with Blake Snell continues to be that most of the problems are not shoulder and elbow, right? He's had a bunch of injuries. I mean the shower pedestal thing hamstring I, toes yeah. weird things there's some strange ones in there he's a little younger you know, he's gonna turn 32 in december uh, we don't know cost where he's pitching. Is lower is my whole point you know <laughs> yeah right you're getting him at the end of round three instead of ponying up that something still seems pretty two. aggressive for snail end of round three huh? end of round three and a 15 teamer yeah I think the the general goal I have is to not have pitching early this year. That's my initial read. It could change because it's October 18th, but my my snap reaction is maybe I can build a really good pitching staff without a pitcher in the first five rounds. Yeah. And live to tell the tale. I feel the same way. And I think it's it's just it's just amazing. The number of pitchers in baseball right now that have had Tommy John is at an all time in at all time high. Thirty nine percent of the pitchers that pitched this year had 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 Tommy John. Now, 
that doesn't mean that Tommy John is peaking. I've looked at the instances of Tommy John surgery and they're down. We're coming off a peak. That's one of those things where the number of people who've had it in the big leagues is actually a lagging indicator, mm. you know, because you're talking about people who have careers, you know, and so they they could have had it four years ago. So the number of Tommy Johns is down a little bit. Uh, but we're also, I th- see, I think seeing a lot more preventative IL usage where maybe these guys wouldn't have gone on the IL in the past, you know, and it's just inflammation. And then they're they're gone for four or five weeks on inflammation. I mean, what was the diagnosis for Cole in the end? I think it was inflammation. That was a nerve. It was a nerve problem for Cole. Okay. And nerve stuff's just weird. Like it, it takes time. And he like wasn't all the way back. He, he's not all the way back in terms of command. He's not where he used to be. In terms right. of velo, he's not where he used to be. And you wonder how much of that is rust. How much of that is tweaking mechanics to not make his elbow feel bad compensating like, yeah mm-hmm. because the slider's not the slider's not as crisp as it used to be i wonder how far down the list i can go you know i had that team a few years ago tyler yeah, tell malley me, tell SP1. Me if we're yeah if we're let's tell me who i'm looking at if i don't take a starter until the fifth round or the sixth round Let's say so. Nobody inside the top seventy-five. Again, these are two drafts. That would uh, let's let's knock out everybody down through Bryce Miller. So that would mean you could. I don't. Pick, even, I don't even get Bryce Miller. No, nah, nah, Bryce Miller's going right there at the end of round five. So we'll cut it off okay. there. Grayson It'd Rodriguez. Be nice to have Bryce Miller as my ace. I would take it. Yeah. So maybe man, around if you're in the right position, end of round five, you could do it. But let's say you're not there. Grayson Rodriguez, Tanner Bybee, mm. Jack Flaherty. Mm. Bailey Ober, mm. Spencer Strider, mm. Freddie Peralta. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now you know my plan. Hunter Brown. <laughs> oh. Aaron Nola. Wow. Logan Webb. Why is Nolan Webb down there? Hey, look, I, I see a plan here. A double tap. Quantity and quality. Freddie Peralta and Aaron Nola. Freddie Peralta and Logan Webb. I would do it, but, you know, that's not a surprise to anybody. <laughs> Spencer Schwellenbach down there? See, the, the nice thing about doing this is, I mean, in all likelihood, you just bought yourself 320, 350 innings of 3-3 three, three ball with something like that, right? That's a good foundation. Now, once you have those innings in hand, then you start taking some higher variance guys after that. Yeah. That who may not ever make it to the end of your, your the end of your league, but you hit on two or three of those. Now you have a four man staff, a five man staff, you know, you're just in these 15 team leagues. You're literally just looking for four pitchers that will stay with you all year. That's what you're trying to do because you're the rest of the guys are going to be off your roster. Some other names that are in this group. I, dude, this is why this is why I was trying to tell you before. I'm like, I think you have a bigger edge right now than you do later, mm. because these are going to change. This this early stuff it will look nothing like March ADP because there are yeah. some unanswered questions about a bunch of players in this group. I mean, I mean, Spencer Strider at 88. If Spencer Strider is healthy in the spring or reports are good in the spring, you're not getting him there. That's mm-hmm. the the benefit of drafting early and taking on the risk is getting discounts on players you won't get discounts on later. Yeah, the risk is right now is kind of rough on Strider there because you, if there's any setbacks or any, he, he could give you two, three months of work next year. It might not be great. You know, we're we're not seeing Tyler Glass now right now. And I think the last update I saw on Rotowire was from two weeks ago and he still wasn't throwing. Uh, but it wasn't Tommy John. He's not expected to undergo surgery. <laughs> oh, he didn't even have a surgery. No, but but he might if he still could. And uh, a more definitive plan is uh, going to happen once they get more scans after the season. So <sighs> that's pretty ominous still. And the, the the price on glass now. The two drafts that have been completed. Pick 69 and pick 159. I feel like maybe that pick 69 was before 
before even the not throwing news came out. Like maybe that was the uh, earliest yeah. draft. And 159 is more like where we're at today. That's I'd love Tyler Glass now as a pitcher. That's that's a possible zero based on where things are at right now because there's so much to be determined but once he ramps up and once they get more looks at you, him. There are other pitchers being taken that are zeros at 150. I mean, yeah, other pitchers that could just be nothing for you in that range for sure. So maybe if he falls, like I could actually throw that dart, but I'm not doing that up in the pick 100 range where you've got Nola, Webb, Schwellenbach, Gallen, Rodon. Carlos Rodon right there seems pretty good, right? Stuff is crisp here in the playoffs. You mentioned before not wanting to get tricked, not falling into a trap because of what you're seeing in the playoffs, but would you say that Carlos Rodon is not actually a trap based on how he's looked throughout the end of the season? Just the 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 risk on him is twofold. It's not only injury, it's that he has poor command. But where that's going, he's always a guy that with the stuff plus projections gets projected for like a three, four ERA. That's the first thing that's going to move the market is when more public facing projections start to drop, that's going to guide some decisions. So it's almost like if you have your own projections or you're good at predicting what a projection is going to do, you could say, hey, wait a minute, that's a two round discount have, on Carlos Rodon. So here we go. We have some uh, end of season projections in the Google Doc for people that want to, to look at them. Uh, just if you're a subscriber, you can follow the link off of any of my rankings. It's it's sitting there right there. Those are context neutral. They're not park adjusted. So I think Rodon will look even nicer in those if I can get it up real quick. How far down this list can we really go? Like the extreme weight for your first pitcher. How far can we go? Can we go down to... I get pretty nervous right around where you were talking. Because All right. if I can't get somebody like a Logan Webb, then then I'm talking about taking on not only performance risk, but um, innings risk. And if like taking both of those just seems like uh, sadism. Yeah, I mean, we got um, Shane McClanahan's throwing live BPs. He's coming off his second Tommy John surgery. So 116.5, the average for McClanahan. Can't draft Carlos, him like an ace. Carlos Rodon's... Um, for some reason, the search function is not working for me on this. You might have to just copy and paste it out and check it out. Um, but here, Carlos Rodon has got to be on here. Brett Phillips has a projection. 4-2-2 ERA with the 20 IVB. Love it. It's pretty good. Brett Phillips to the pen next year. Here we go. Carlos Rodon's uh, stuff-based park neutral injury pro projection ERA is 3.86. Clark Schmidt is 3.7. Garrett Cole is 3.6. <clears throat> Just it's a, a knowledge solid, year holes. Solid like SP three at a minimum but probably a two if you stretch it a little bit and then back it up with Plus a few more arms wins and wins lots of wins how about shane boz i know i'm fascinated with ray's pitching forever and always pick 130 and pick 150 in the two drafts so far i was looking at his game log we talked about the addition of stuff plus by game on fan graphs and i think when we saw boz come back initially he wasn't quite as crisp as he was pre-injury. Things didn't look as good. The numbers by the end of the year look solid. I don't know if they're still lagging he, behind. He's going after Pepio. So is, is Pepio going before this place? Pepio is going after right now. Pepio is going I've, at 153 and 180 for the two drafts in so far. I've taken Pepio over Boz um, for a few reasons. Uh, just a little bit of maturity, you know, in terms of may, having made some adjustments, a better projection, context neutral, 378 for Pepio, 407 for Boz, 25% uh, strikeout rate for Pepio. Plus, uh, the other part of the context here is that I feel like um, the uh, Rays are going to need someone to throw innings. And so they're going to need to have uh, they're going to need to have somebody out there on day one that they can kind of pitch all year. And I think that's a little bit more Pepio. 
I think they can push a lot of these guys, though, now. I mean, the one that I think they're going to be most careful with is McClanahan because it's multiple Tommy Johns, and he didn't get and back Rasmussen. yet. And Rasmussen. Rasmussen, be very careful with him. I, I can see maybe stacking a couple of pitchers, though, from this staff at these prices. Like, why not? Um, I think we did mention earlier in the week, you know, the, the roof damage from Hurricane Milton on the trop. That I saw a story from Mark Topkin following up there not expected to have that fixed for opening day. So and, the, and they're where not, are they playing is a huge question. Montreal's not an option because you know everyone said that and it's kind of a fun idea, but they're putting a roof on the stadium in Montreal. So they're in the middle of renovations there. It, I don't think that's an option. Uh Durham came out and said, we love Tampa. They're our parents. <laughs> um but we don't expect to be the home of the Tampa Bay Rays this this coming season. So uh, I've seen people say, what about Steinbrenner Field? I think Tampa owns that, not the Yankees. Uh, but that would be super weird. To be that would be weird. I, I've been to that park. It's a nice it's a nice spring training park, but it'd be very strange to it's, play regular it's season games spring there. Training cards. It's, one yeah, of, it's, it's the closest. I mean, we're already having them play in spring training in, in Sacramento. Rays to Oakland from producer Brian Smith is something that's been floated. The only problem is they're in the AL East. That'd be, <laughs> that'd be a really rough one. You'd be signing so, on for some bad travel. Yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was, uh, you know, one of their uh, minor league parks in 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 Tampa. There, one of theirs. I mean, in Florida. Or where is it their spring? Where's their spring location? It's they they played their. I think are they Port Charlotte. Yeah, but Port Charlotte just had a bunch of um, stuff happen to it. Yeah, right. I, it's it's not a great situation. I mean, they can't I, play in Tampa with the roof off because it doesn't have the draining for it. Could you play? I mean, I, I know a lot of times when there's a like a series or a game we made up, they use Milwaukee because of the roof there. You're not going to get cancellations. I don't know if you can do anything with the schedule to just stagger it where Brewers are gone, Rays are in. Can you use some other major league facility anywhere? Can you even play in Atlanta? Is there any way to make that maybe. schedule work? I mean, the way that the Ra- the A's are doing it right now in Sacramento is they're actually sharing it with a minor league team. So I'm a right. little surprised that Durham came out and said that it's not possible because they're doing it in Sacramento. The The Sacramento team is staying there, and they're both playing there. Yeah. I mean, They've also done this in the past with, with major league teams. I I think your best actual the bet Yankees would be... and the Mets shared the same facility for a little bit. That'd be strange. A triple-A a park that is somewhat close geographically that quarter of the country that third of the country because then you're not making your travel worse you have a facility that's large enough and close to major league ready that maybe with a few temporary upgrades this could be fine this might make some of the raised pitchers less of a, a good bet than we think that was the one thing that was kind of kicking around in my head i'm like mm, maybe stacking the raise right now until we until we know where that's going to be, maybe that's a little bit risky. Because I think Pepio's you know, good enough to be good anywhere, and I think Boz is. Bradley, though, you know, it's he's so he's so high variance anyway. If he he could figure it out and be an ace next year, he's he's that type of special arm. But he also, you know, could be in a minor league park that gives up a bunch of homers and just has another bad year. So it's you know, uh, Pepio's the one that I would be comfortable pitching no matter where he pitches i feel like one other name to throw at you before we go sandy el contra coming back from tommy john surgery was a workhorse before the injury did have a down year in 2023 relative but we saw the previous two seasons but it's a great track record gets the pitcher friendly home park in Not miami gonna give you the strikeout rate of an ace no, but I I think the tricky thing is always going to be like how hard are they going to push him? You know, like are they I mean, it's a little bit like a Logan Webb where you don't know if you have the innings. Yeah, it's a little bit like that, but if the price is pick 174, that's the earlier of the two picks so far, he, he's definitely going to move up, right? Like, reports should be positive all that, but he missed where, all where are you forecasting war, so he's going to yeah. be pitching in spring as if it's the beginning of a new season. He's got no it's not like oh he's going to start in i mean walker bueller missed all of one season and did have setbacks so i do think that the information in spring will be valuable and that's that's the to me the big difference between 
TJ number one and TJ number two. I, I think mm-hmm. you can sometimes see more more struggles for the second one. But I like where he's going. I think that's a, a fair early target to consider if you're looking for some bulk. You want ratios, especially in that range. Like even if you're using him for most most of his starts, like all of his home starts and half of his road starts, that's fine for that late. You're not paying you know pre injury prices or anything close to it for Sandy Alcantara. So. Yeah, I think it's going to be a year of waiting on pitching. I think that's the the early outlook. We'll see if that changes. And there's a few early names we've mentioned that we do actually like. Uh, I mean, building around Paul Skeen sounds kind of fun, but you have to draw the right spot in the actual draft order yeah, to make to that happen. Get him. I think we have seen some evidence from early drafts that um, there is a sort of a general wait on pitching feeling. And I think that's also... For the reason you mentioned earlier, people wait because there's a lot that can go wrong for a pitcher between now and the middle of March. That's mm-hmm. the other part of the bump. You get more information, but you also shorten the timeline for guys to get hurt. So that's yeah. the other part of it, too. You get through most of spring training healthy. Okay, great. You're you're okay. Let's, let's go ahead and throw you on the roster. We'll see guys jump up two or three rounds, four rounds in some cases, from where they're going right now. So think about yeah, that think if Sandy, you sign up for those Sandy's- early drafts. You know, as Sandy gets news about his health, that's that's one that's going to move. All the former aces that have big injuries year over year over year, they're always discounted right now. This is the time to get them if you think they're going to be mostly okay. Uh, we're going to go one little bit of news as we go. You will see Jeff McNeil playing for the Mets in, in the starting lineup. I think they had to make that switch. Iglesias just has not been giving them much. It also feels like Iglesias is the kind of player that if they get into a key spot this weekend, if the series does go beyond Friday or even in Friday's game, Iglesias comes in off the bench as a pinch hitter and like slaps a double down the line and ends up making a huge difference, right? A like, nice thing about using him as a pinch hitter as opposed to like a David Fry is you can use him as a pinch hitter for anybody and he can step in and play the position. Right, he can stay in the game defensively. I think think yeah. that's the right call. If you believe Jeff McNeil is you know, mostly himself, he's the better hitter of those two, even though Iglesias has put up some ridiculous numbers at City Field so far this season. Thanks to Brian Smith for producing this episode. We are going to go on our way out the door. A reminder, you can get a subscription to The Athletic. $2 a month gets you in the door at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Find Eno at Eno Saris on Twitter. Find me at Derek Van Riper. Find the pod at rates and barrels. Enjoy the baseball this weekend. We're back with you on Monday. Thanks for listening.